Thank you very much. Um, I'm an environmental historian. Um, so I'm, I'm coming at this from the perspective of seeing things in the long term. And so I'll have what I want to do today. Um, the, the title on the program is Environmental History as a Tool for Policymaking. But of course, that's huge. Um, and so I wanted to focus in specifically on some things in the urban fabric that I noticed we weren't going to hear a lot about. Um, and that is the non-humans in our urban life. And so I wanted to focus on learning to live in a multi-species city, uh, thinking beyond people, because that's what the environment really is. And so I wanted to do today is to tell you some stories um, from the past, and um, hopefully we can learn some lessons about what some potential responses are to a multi-species city and where we might be able to go. So I'll start with a story of control. So in 1354, the city council of the town of Norwich, England, recorded that persons and children have been hurt by boars. Children have been killed and eaten. Bodies have been exhumed from the cemeteries. And people have been maimed. And there are many persons of the said city that have received great injuries as the wrecking of their houses, destructions of the gardens of these, because of these pigs, which great complaint is brought before the city, imploring the bailiffs and the community to remedy them of these misfortunes. Now, the medieval town or city was a mixed-use space uh, where you had markets and courts and housing and agriculture all mingled together. Animals were not interlopers in urban areas, but regular residents, and pigs were one of these. Now, pigs are large, they're intelligent, they're omnivorous animals, and they provide really great on-leg uh, meat content that's easily salted for long-term storage, and that made them perfect for having in the city. They're flexible eaters, so you can feed them food scrap as well as vegetation from pasture land and cropland. Afterwards, the stubble from crops are ideal, so they don't require a large amount of space to roam. This made them inexpensive to raise and convenient. But, as Norwich found out, they were not necessarily easy to control. So the responses from the town government were to implement required pinning and herding of these animals, so for town regulations in the late medieval period, and there's many towns like this, not just Norwich, they almost inevitably required pigs to be kept within styes. So you had to keep them locked up, except on particular days in which you took them out to clean the sty. And second, they employed swine herds, and the city paid for this. This was part of the city's responsibility to hire a swine herd to go around and collect everybody's pigs, take them out to the pasture, bring them back. So they all had, everybody knew whose pigs was whose. And this was part of the city government, part of what they did. So banning or removing these animals was not seen as desirable. There was a need to accommodate daily life and routines, but manage the animal's presence. This is control. Now I want to turn to another story, and this one is about care. On Sunday afternoon, the 18th of May, 2008, a rope factory in the urban center of Oslo caught fire. Over 100 people living in the area were evacuated because of the smoke. But during work to suppress the blaze, a fireman, old Arne Lande, noticed a badger baby, which is called a kit, and he grabbed it as he was uh, running out of oxygen. Now, they brought the flames in the building under control, and Lande and a fellow fireman, Espen Soli, re-entered the building, which was still smoldering. So the roof was still uh, not on fire, but smoldering, and smoke is coming out. They broke through the floorboards of the building, where they'd seen the badger kit standing, and found, in fact, more kits huddling together in this den that was under this floor. The mother was nowhere to be seen. The two firemen, uh, here a picture of them rescuing the badger kits from the building, were hailed as heroes of the day. And all the news outlets carried pictures of the men and the badger babies. 
The next day, however, the firemen were not happy. They discovered that these badger kits they had saved had been euthanized. That means they were killed. The firemen were furious. Uh, Landa told the National NRK Service, our purpose is to rescue people, animals, and property in that order. This feels completely pointless. We underlined when we turned in the animals that they must be treated well. We knew that this would be a media story and we hoped it would bring forward people who would take care of them. They felt betrayed, these firemen. Uh, the smoke uh, and the spokesman for the city of Oslo's wildlife committee, the Vietnam, defended the decision saying, well, we don't have a system for rehabilitation of badgers. We didn't have the capacity to call around the country to find something like that on a Sunday. Now, there was much debate as to whether or not this was true and this was the case. But what the story tells us is that the modern city is actually filled with wild animal inhabitants. Squirrels, hedgehogs, pigeons, sparrows, frogs, and many other small critters live within the confines of our European cities. It's their natural habitat. Mice and rats receive the most frequent negative response because they take up residence inside of our houses. But many of these others are seen as indicators of an environmentally friendly urban area. So the badger incident reveals the pre presence, of the persistence of care for these wild animals in the urban space. So the firemen exercised this care. They wanted to care for this animal. Of course, so did the wildlife committee. They wanted to care for them. They favor humane killing over potentially distressful life which explains the difference in how their care was acted out. Now, care for urban wildlife has been integrated into the routines of cities in Norway and Sweden through institutionalization. City governments have standing committees responsible for handling wildlife issues within the city limits. They're responsible for paying for rehabilitation or destruction of animals that are found injured. So through care, small animals have found a place in the rules and rituals of the city. My third story is one about compromise. And this is a tale about the medieval saint Francis of Assisi. So there was a fierce wolf living near the city of Gubbio, where he was living, which was killing livestock and people in the countryside immediately adjacent to the city. So St. Francis went out to the countryside to find the wolf. Now, of course, this is a story that's recorded and people believed it. Whether or not it happened like this is beside the point. Uh, the wolf came out to meet the saint, who was able to tame him with the sign of the cross. St. Francis admonished the wolf for his behavior, especially the killing of humans, which he'd been doing. But then he added, he tells the wolf, but I desire, brother wolf, to make peace between you and them, so that you may offend them no more, and they shall forgive you of all your past offenses, and neither men nor dogs shall pursue you anymore. The wolf showed his acceptance of the saint's admonishment, and St. Francis promised the people that the people would bring the wolf food, because he was well aware that hunger is what had motivated the wolf. So after the deal was sealed with a hand paw shake, which we see here in this uh, painting, from 1437 to 44 in there. Francis explained to the residents of Gubbio that the wolf wouldn't bother them anymore, but they must promise henceforth to give him daily all that's needed to him. And so the wolf and the people lived in peace for the rest of the wolf's life. This is a story of compromise. What are we going to do to compromise with the non-human other? And my final story is one of creativity. At sunset every day from March to November, thousands of human spectators gather in Austin, Texas to see the largest urban bat colony in the world come out for their night hunting. This isn't a cave where most people think bats live. Instead, these bats roost under the bridge beams of the Ann W. Richards Congress Avenue Bridge a migratory Mexican free-tailed bat colony of over one million bats 
comes each year to the underside of this bridge since the mid-1980s to make their home and raise their young. It's a, a maternity colony, so they come pregnant, have the babies under the bridge. Now, the Congress Avenue Bridge had crossed the Colorado River in downtown Austin, smack in the middle of the capital of Texas, uh, since 1910. But it was renovated in 1980, and the new design added expansion joints to meet the current design standards. These turned out to be perfect nooks for bats. And the bats started showing up to roost under the bridge in 1982. As you can see, the bridge is located over the river, which has an immediate lake uh, nearby, which was perfect for bats, provides lots of insect food. So in September 1984, newspapers started carrying articles, local newspapers in Austin, about several hundred thousand bats being under the bridges. They were concerned because four people had been bitten by bats, uh, which of course is what made it news. And there was raise concerns about rabies being spread by bats. Because two to three percent of all bats carry rabies in the US. And although that's not a very large percentage, it means if you are bitten by a bat, you need to have very painful rabies shots. So understandably, some of the reactions to the bats under the bridge were negative. So a, a city health administrator uh, said that the city government was considering covering expansion joints with wire screens so that the bats couldn't roost there. But they decided against it for an interesting reason. They said, well, the bats might actually relocate to less desirable places, like parking garages. So we'd rather have them under the bridge. The founder of the Bat Conservation International, which was founded at just almost the same time that these bats started showing up, uh, responded quickly to this news, headlines like, bat colonies sink teeth into city, and started an outreach program in Austin, relocated their headquarters specifically to change public opinion about the bats. And it worked. The bats were rapidly adopted as a tourist attraction and now even a symbol of the city. By 1990, the bats were recognized by the city parks and recreation department as a nature attraction worthy of a large educational display along the river's trail. The city approved the installation of an artwork, a big kinetic metal sculpture, so it like moves with the wind of a stylized bat that's near the bridge. There is now an annual bat fest, which features live music, arts and craft ven vendors, and bat-themed activities on this very large bridge uh, to see the nightly emergence, which started in 2004 and is still going strong. This was a creative response to living with our non-human friends. So to make sustainable cities, I think we need to learn to live in a multi-species environment. And there are many different responses that can happen uh, when we deal with those others. We can try to control where they go, what they do, how we interact. We can show care for them. We can compromise. We can realize that as humans, we need to make some changes in order to accommodate their needs. Think for yourself of uh, how many people have speed, um, bird feed that you put out over the winter. That is making a compromise. You use a little money and you help the birds to have food over the winter and you, they stay there. This is about care. It can also be about control, where you put them, where you allow them to be, where you don't. And we have the opportunity to come up with creative solutions to making the city a more habitable place for everyone. Thank you.